you know, a little bit about this exhibit. The third wave of feminism refers to the resurgence of women's rights activism in the 1990s. Its proponents sought to continue the work of their second wave predecessors while also addressing contemporary struggles in ways that were inclusive of those from different racial and class backgrounds, as well as in uh, sexual orientations and gender identities. Intersectionality, the idea that one's identities overlap to influence one's lived experience became an important component of feminism in this period. The origins of the first wave lay in both the era's political events and pop culture trends, as we'll see in the exhibit tour. The 1991 congressional testimony of attorney Anita Hill alleging sexual har harassment by then Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas brought national attention to the issue of sexual harassment and ushered in the year of the woman when an unprecedented 27 women were elected to Congress in 1992. Meanwhile, punk rock musicians decided they wanted to start a girl riot in response to the sexism they encountered in the music scene and society at large. They started their own punk bands as well as publications known as zines dedicated to female empowerment using their music and writing to oppose racism and misogyny. The riot girl movement attracted a new generation of women and girls to feminism. The movement's girl power message later became commercialized into mainstream pop culture, but Riot Girl's unabashed spirit and do-it-yourself approach inspired activism across the globe and foreshadowed the social media advocacy of the fourth wave. Feminism, the third wave, is available now on the museum's website in both English and Spanish. Please join me in welcoming Mariana Brandon to the screen. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Lorianne, so much for that lovely introduction. Um, so welcome to this virtual tour of feminism, the third wave. As Lorianne said, the third of a four part exhibit series on the waves of feminism. Uh, if you haven't already, I encourage you to view the exhibits on the first and second waves, um, as well as the corresponding symposia events the museum has held for each exhibit called the missing waves of feminism. And uh, the final uh, exhibit that on the fourth wave of feminism will launch in early December. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Today, I'll be going through the NWHM exhibit, adding further context and detail about the third wave. I'll also share a few images that are not included in the exhibit, um, but I still uh, won't be able to get to everything. We'll cover the big hits of the third wave, but there's still a lot more to the story. So to that end, um, I've also included through Lorianne a list of resources that will go in the chat. Um, there are resources that I mention or draw on throughout the presentation. Um, and so before we uh, dig into the exhibit itself, I just wanna to quickly touch on some of the themes that are important to the exhibit that we'll be going through. Um, so first I want to mention the debate over the waves metaphor itself. So the waves metaphor is useful to describe particularly active periods of feminist organizing um, at distinct moments in history but many experts feel that at the same time, the metaphor really limits how we understand feminist history. So the most prominent critiques of this metaphor say that it erases or obscures the history of feminist activism between these various waves. Um, and that the metaphor emphasizes periods in which middle-class white women were most active, that it overlooks the work of women of color, women with disabilities, working class women, uh, queer women, anyone who fell outside that straight, white, cis, middle-class paradigm. And that it also overlooks the work they did uh, responding to forms of oppression beyond um, sexism and misogyny. So this important conversation, um, you know, is, is um, necessary to keep it going through our uh, coverage of the third wave. But I also wanna point out that it's something the museum has made a central part of this exhibit series. Um, so it's why the symposia, for example, um, associated with each exhibit are entitled the missing waves of feminism it is to keep this interrogation of the metaphor at the forefront. Um, so I also wanna note that this wave metaphor, it lends itself to the premise that um, sorry, that each wave ex uh, exceeds its predecessor, that it's, each wave is, is superior to the previous one, uh, but the reality of the history is much more nuanced than that. 
So these notions of uh, competition between the waves, they came from both inside the movement, um, from activists, uh, um, sorry. So they came from both inside the movement and outside in terms of media narratives that were scripted about the movement. So it could have been the result of activists trying to distinguish themselves or organizers who are feeling defensive about uh, when they feel their efforts are being attacked. Um, but it also comes from media reports that say flattened really complex issues into these tiny sound bites. Um, I think it's interesting to share here just a taste of the very academic debate that has gone on over the waves metaphor in uh, the field of feminist history. Um, so the scholarship now, a lot of it looks at other meanings of waves to try to reckon with how this metaphor can still be useful um, to try to reframe the history of the movement. So there is work that looks at the physics of ocean waves and their cross currents and eddies or work that studies um, the behavior of radio waves or electromagnetic waves that historians are really getting creative with it as we try to adapt this uh, waves metaphor to the growing field of history as we're learning it. And also that um, historians of feminism are looking at other subfields of history uh, for inspiration. So there are many historians of feminism who are calling for a quote, long women's rights movement, the way scholars of African-American history have framed a long civil rights movement, um, one that spans from before the civil war uh, through the mid 20th century civil rights movement uh, and beyond. Um, and so with that, I am going to open up the exhibit. Um, okay, let's dive in. Um, so another important theme, um, as we'll see here, is that there are many connections across the waves. Um, so here we see pictured a uh, second wave, a uh, lawyer, activist, congresswoman, really icon, Bella Abzug, uh, pictured left next to one of the faces of the third wave, uh, attorney Anita Hill. I thought it was a good image to, to highlight that notion. Um, and as we continue through this exhibit, I'll point out some of the many other connections uh, that, that we find that we encounter across the waves. So in examples like feminists laying claim to rock music, uh, to the Me Too movement and its roots, to um, youth culture today and its roots that we see in the third wave. Um, but okay, before we go even further, I wanna set the stage a bit regarding the political and social context that we're going into with the third wave. So with the 1980s into the early 90s, it's the Reagan and George H.W. Bush years. This is known as a time of backlash against feminism. Now, of course, feminists were still active in this time, but the rise of the conservative right in the 80s, along with the loss of momentum in the women's movement, mainly due to the defeat of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1982, um, it really meant that the, the women's movement had faded in cultural prominence during these years. And also beginning in the mid 80s, there was a growing conservative agenda that campaigned against things like political correctness, women's studies and ethnic studies, um, affirmative action. So these, uh, these campaigns, these debates really took place in academia uh, with issues like federal funding for the arts. But these culture wars, as they were known, reverberated throughout American society. Now, many third wave activists were born during the second wave years in the 1960s and 70s. And growing up, they didn't face the same legal barriers to education, work, access to sports that their mothers did. But instead, when they came of age, feminism faced a very unique challenge in that it seemed to be both present everywhere and nowhere. Its ideas and goals seemed to permeate contemporary life, but it was also difficult to locate. The movement seemed um, fragmented and diffuse. So for example, while the second wave, the women's liberation movement, they primarily battled du jour or overt discrimination, trying to amend or overturn discriminatory laws. By the 1990s, the struggle was much more of a de facto one 
dealing with attitudes and practices rather than laws and regulations. So this reality also led to discussions of post-feminism, the idea that feminism was no longer needed because gender equality had been achieved. So this, as you might imagine, parallels the discussion of a quote, post-racial America uh, following Barack Obama's election as president in 2008. And so now what I wanna do is define some of the principles of the third wave briefly. So the activists who identified as third waivers challenged the understanding of feminism as a monolithic sisterhood, one that was largely defined by um, white middle-class women, uh, which was the image that predominated during the second wave. Instead, these activists favored multiplicity, diversity, intersectionality. So consequently, three core principles of the third wave are one, a polyvocal feminism that acknowledges multiple perspectives. Two, an intersectional feminism that recognizes that gender justice is inextricably tied to other social justice movements. And three, a non-dogmatic feminism that allows for the complexities and contradictions of lived experience. So understandably, it's difficult to pinpoint a distinct beginning moment for the third wave, but we'll get into some of the key events that ushered it in. The Anita Hill hearings, Rebecca Walker's coining of the term the third wave, uh, and the feminist cultural productions of punk rock riot girl groups and the Guerrilla Girls. So first, the 1991 Anita Hill hearings sparked national feminist support when attorney Anita Hill testified that Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas sexually harassed her when she worked for him. So while watching the hearings, Rebecca Walker, who is the daughter of the second wave icon and author Alice Walker, wrote an essay for Ms. Magazine entitled, I Am the Third Wave. It's a short essay. I included it in the list of resources. I encourage everyone to read it for themselves. Um, a few points that I think are noteworthy from it are her references to both previous generations, uh, you know, her mother and earlier generations and uh, future generations, as well as the, the idea that her awakening in reaction to the Anita Hill hearings is one of many throughout her life, that her feminist consciousness has been a progression over time. Um, so there's just a lot of uh, connections rather than this kind of one-off spark in it. And she closes the essay saying, quote, I am not a post-feminism feminist, I am the third wave. Now, Rebecca Walker, writing as a biracial and bisexual woman, did not fit in easily to prescriptive categories. Um, and as a result, she called for third wave principles kind of that I'd mentioned before, the recognition of complexity and contradiction in the movement, as well as a focus on social justice issues beyond um, women's rights. So the museum was lucky enough to have Rebecca Walker join us for the symposium on the third wave. Um, if you weren't able to join us for that event, I encourage you to check out the recording. It will be posted on our website soon. Um, and in that Walker and other experts shared their insights about the third wave and particularly about um, how we see its effects today. And it's a uh, very, it's an invaluable watch. Okay, let's see here. So this is third, third wave liter literature. Let's get the whole thing in the frame. So the feminist scholarship of the third wave was an important contribution of the movement. There were major advances, advancements in gender and queer theory among academics at the time. Uh, but I wanna focus on the theory that had the most significant impact outside of the academy, um, that of intersectionality. So in 1989, um, lawyer and theorist Kimberly Crenshaw developed intersectionality to show how someone's various identities, their race, their gender, their sexuality, for example, overlap to influence how they are treated and how they see the world. And so this theory um, had a profound influence within feminism leading to intersectional feminism that formed as a response to you know, the multiple ways that women can be oppressed. Now, Crenshaw herself will tell you that the concept is not new that she recognizes a long line of African-American women who have articulated the need to examine race and gender together. 
She developed this theory in response to the failure of uh, anti-discrimination law to address the compound effect that women of color face. As the law, um, the way it works, it addresses racial and gender discrimination separately. Crenshaw said that she wanted to come up with an everyday uh, metaphor that people could use to say, okay, it's, you know, it's good for me to understand the kind of discriminations that occur along one avenue, um, along this axis, but what happens when it flows into another, hence intersection. So now intersectionality has grown markedly in cultural prominence in recent years. Uh, to the point where some may not know that this concept has a centuries long history, that the theory is several decades old now. So this is one legacy of the third wave we're really seeing today. So the Anita Hill hearings. Um, these are probably the most familiar part of the story for many. Uh, briefly on October 11th, 1991, the world watched as attorney, attorney Anita Hill testified against US Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas for sexual harassment. In televised hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Hill claimed that Thomas had repeatedly harassed her while she worked for him at the Department of Education and then also at the Equal um, Employment Opportunity Commission. And despite Hill's testimony, uh, Thomas was still confirmed to the bench as a Supreme Court justice after those three-day hearings. Now, although both Thomas and Hill are African-American, Thomas alleged that the hearing against him was equivalent to, quote, a high-tech lynching, suggesting that he was being persecuted because of his race. So both Hill and Thomas testified before an all-white, all-male Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, but the history of African-American women also being lynched, also suffering this persecution, was not discussed. Um, now, Kimberly Crenshaw, who developed intersectionality, she was actually a member of Hill's legal team at the hearing, and she called out this description for erasing Black women uh, from this picture. So the next slide in the exhibit is actually a brief video about Ida B. Wells, the pioneering journalist and civil rights advocate who led campaigns, um, anti-lynching campaigns at the turn of the 20th century. And I'm gonna skip it uh, for the purposes of this tour. Of course, I do recommend watching it, but the story really goes further than Wells and her work. Black women were the victims of lynchings as well, not just black men. And further, the motivations for lynchings you know, were often attributed to revenge for claims of sexual violence by black men on white women, which were nearly always, always false. However, these lies and the pernicious myth of black male sexual violence overshadowed the very real threat of sexual violence that black women faced at the hands of white men. Um, this is a long and important history and for more on it, I always recommend uh, the incredible book by Danielle McGuire, At the Dark End of the Street. Um, it tells about the work of black women to fight for justice and uh, combat sexual violence by white men. Um, and I've included it in the resources list. Um, so yes. Definitely recommend that to learn more. So I'm gonna skip ahead. So after the Anita Hill hearings, African-American feminists and historians across the country came together and collectively raised $50,000 to purchase a full page ad in the New York Times and other newspapers. Their manifesto entitled African-American Women in Defense of Ourselves was signed by more than 1,600 women and expressed the outrage they felt at the racist and sexist treatment of Professor Hill um, for simply daring to speak publicly of her experience with sexual abuse. And so with that, I want to show you the ad itself. Um, it's a little hard to get it all in frame, but here we can see the manifesto in the center and it is surrounded by um, the names and locations of the signatories to the ad. Um, so following Hill's story, many other women had the courage to speak out um, against their own experiences with sexual misconduct. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, where um, Hill had, had worked for Thomas, actually saw a more than 50% rise in the number of harassment complaints that it received the following year. 
Now this outpouring of harassment reports, um, it was a predecessor to the 2017 Me Too campaign. Um, so many saw Me Too as a continuation of the work that was begun, but left incomplete um, by, uh, sorry, <laughs> left incomplete following the Hill hearings. So what I do wanna mention here, um, because it has gotten attention in popular culture lately, is uh, the documentary and film um, about the story. So there was the 2013 documentary, Anita, and in 2016, um, HBO actually put out a movie called Confirmation starring Kerry Washington as Hill. Um, I can recommend Confirmation. I saw it, I, I think it's good, but with an, any dramatization of history, I always recommend um, you know, Googling it afterwards, seeing what's fact, what's dramatized. Um, and I can tell you that Confirmation was generally praised, especially for Kerry Washington's performance. Um, but it was criticized for leaving out the work of other Black feminists in the story, such as Kimberly Crenshaw on the legal team or the um, activists and feminists and scholars who banded together to put out this ad and issue this declaration. Okay, so now we get to the year of the woman. So for many mainstream feminists, the Hill case marked a turning point in women's activism. Not only were women speaking publicly about sexual assault and harassment, but the visibility of the case also caused women to question the predominantly male leadership in Congress. So that year, um, I mean, the very next year, that 1992, um, more women were elected to Congress than ever before, 27 in total. And so 1992 became known as the year of the woman. Um, so pictured here, we see um, many of the candidates for Congress for the House and Senate in 1992. Um, but I do want to provide context that even after 1992, after that election, women made up less than 10% of the House of Representatives, and that the three women who were elected to the Senate in 1992 actually tripled the number of women serving in that chamber. So um, it's also important here to mention the work of groups like Emily's List. Um, so one of the early women's groups that contributed to the success of the Year of the Woman was Emily's List. It provided fundraising and resources necessary for an effective campaign. Their strategy was to raise, um, raise funds early in the campaign so it would attract more donors. Hence the, the name of the group, which is an acronym. Um, Emily is early money is like yeast because it makes the dough rise. And um, Emily's List continues to endure sorry, endorse pro-choice democratic women running for office to this day. So the group was founded in 1985. Uh, here pictured is Ellen Malcolm, uh, its primary founder, but it's really the political energy coming out of the Anita Hill hearings that um, kind of launches it to the next level. Uh, from one year to the next, their membership went from 3,000 to 24,000. And in 1992, they were able to donate four times as much money to female um, Democratic candidates as they had two years prior. But also this feminist energy coming out of 1991 into 1992, it really went beyond just Congress. As the New York Times reported in 92, quote, in a surge of feminism not seen since the late 1970s, thousands of women in New York City have started to embrace radical tactics, to press for undiminished abortion rights, improved women's health care, pay equity, artistic freedom, and an end to violence against women. So now we're going to switch gears um, from politics to culture. Of course, those are always very intertwined as well. Um, here in this image, you'll see the band Bratmobile performing. Uh, in the 1990s, punk rock musicians began to emerge with distinctly feminist agendas. Responding to various forms of sexism, feminist musicians decided to organize a girl riot uh, through their activism, hence the name Riot Girl. And you also get the kind of growling girl in there. Um, but before we do more on uh, the Riot Girl movement, we are gonna look at a predecessor of theirs in the fine art world, the Gorilla Girls. So 
prior to the riot girl movement, the guerrilla girls set the foundation for radical feminist revolt. Uh, they formed in 1985 in response to sexism and racism in the art world. This anonymous group of feminist artists from New York City created posters, billboards, and they made appearances in guerrilla masks to reveal the sexist and racist practices that permeated the creation and study of visual art. Um, and yes, the guerrilla mask did originally come about from a spelling error that one of the members made, and they decided to go with it and embrace the guerrilla theme as well. Um, so one of their most famous posters is excerpted here in the exhibit. Um, it features the freight, uh, sorry, it features a naked woman in the freight with wearing a gorilla mask next to the phrase, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And then um, you can see part of it, it also states less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. So between 1985 and 2000, the Guerrilla Girls created approximately 80 such posters, as well as um, stickers, bus ads, magazine spreads, a newsletter, they put out exhibits, uh, they made public appearances at colleges, museums, street protests, um, and they also published three books on the history of Western art and female stereotypes. And so I just wanna show some of their other works here too. Here we have what's fashionable, prestigious, and tax deductible. Um, so this is one of their posters that calls out corporations and foundations listed on the left um, that have sponsored exhibitions um, that are almost exclusively male and white. And so you see um, the statistics over there on the right. So the Guerrilla Girls declared their desire to make feminism sexy, positive, fashionable. They were highly aware of the negative public opinion um, of feminism during the Reagan and Bush era and used humor to undercut the negativity that had come to surround feminism. Irony and sarcasm allowed them to juxtapose the art world's perception of itself as a liberal progressive space with the realities um, of its practice. And they used simple numbers um, as evidence to further that absurdity. So their work was a way to combine laughter and rage. Um, and to that end, another poster of theirs that I've always really liked is the advantages of being a woman artist. And a few choice lines from this poster include having an escape from the art world in your four freelance jobs, seeing your ideas live on in the work of others and not having to undergo the embarrassment of being called a genius. So the Guerrilla Girls, they did help foster progress um, early on, uh, but you know, progress wasn't linear and still been slow to come. Um, they actually in 2015, you know, kind of redid one of their surveys um, to show the difference from 1985. And it's, you know, the numbers are one instead of zero in terms of solo female exhibitions per year. It's still still rather dispiriting, but it is marginally better. And um, I think it's well summed up by two Guerrilla Girls members who have since said, what really changed is that when we first started, we had to convince people that the situation was wrong. Now what we have to do is remind them that it's wrong. Okay, back to the exhibit. Okay, so starting in the early 1990s, uh, radical feminist art seeped into the music world as the riot girl movement emerged out of Olympia, Washington. So one of the front runners of this movement was Kathleen Hanna. Um, we'll see her on the next slide. She was the lead singer of the band Bikini Kill. And um, so she collaborated on a small magazine called Riot Girl. Um, and from that, uh, the fanzine for the band um, the fanzine Bikini Kill Zine was born. And this led to a proliferation of others um, you know, across the country. These zines, these fan-made uh, magazines used punk rock culture to address feminist issues. Um, and so in these pictures, you can see uh, what some of these zines look like, what their handmade uh, style was, was like. So Riot Girl represented a, a, a new kind of youthful do-it-yourself feminism 
It was a grassroots uprising that encouraged girls to actively engage in cultural production, to create their own music, their own fanzines. Um, and Riot Girl bands used their music to express feminist and anti-racist viewpoints. Bands like Bikini Kill, Bratmobile, Heavens to Betsy, they created songs with extremely personal lyrics that dealt with topics like rape, incest, and eating disorders. And when you look at the Riot Girl movement, we can see a lot of elements of contemporary youth culture today. Targeted communication and social networking, an emphasis on the local and the handmade, and you know, just the assertion that feminism can be both funny and joyful. Um, so yes, yeah, so here we see uh, Kathleen Hanna pictured. And um, that zine I mentioned before, the Bikini uh, Kill zine, they published the Riot Girl Manifesto in 1991. And so here we have a, a few key statements from it excerpted that, that give a, an idea of what their message was. They wrote, because us girls crave records and books and fanzines that speak to us so that we feel included in and can better understand our own ways. Because we wanna make it easier for girls to see and hear each other's work so that we can share strategies and applaud and criticize each other because we don't wanna to assimilate to someone else's, a boy's standard of what is or isn't. And most fundamentally, because we are angry at a society that tells us that girl equals dumb, girl equals bad, girl equals weak. So many women flock to these punk rock groups that valued self-expression and collective revolt. Uh, Kathleen Hanna was known for empowering women at her concerts by shouting girls to the front. Uh, to encourage the female attendees at the shows to come to the front of the audience. And this created a safe space for them, one they weren't used to at rock shows with you know, um, primarily male audiences um, where they did not feel safe in the mosh pits at, um, up front. And this was a chance for them to enjoy that joy and energy um, in a safer space. Um, and it, but also um, on another level, it reflected the call from these riot girl groups for women to come to the forefront in all areas of life. Um, and another um, kind of key thing that came out of the movement was an emphasis on promoting music education, particularly that of rock music for young girls. Um, so you saw schools and camps pop up as a result. Now, Riot Girl is indelibly associated with the third wave, um, but the 1990s was not the first time that rock music played a role in the feminist movement. So there, um, in the early 70s, there was the Chicago Women's Liberation Rock Band and its sister band, uh, the New Haven Women's Liberation Rock Band. Uh, together, the two uh, groups released a vinyl LP called Mountain Moving Day in 1972. And you know, these bands were created by women who were tired of hearing pop music glorify the subjugation and degradation of women. So these band members um, tried to turn the star culture of rock music inside out. Uh, they switched out girl for man in the lyrics of popular songs. They pranced around the stage, grabbing themselves a la stars like Mick Jagger. Um, and the audience would get into it too and act like groupies. Um, so that's just you know, one example of uh, another connection across these waves. Uh, but at the time in the 1990s, there was important work going on in other genres of music as well. Um, you have the native tongues movement, which challenged the overt misogyny in rap and hip hop. And their uh, female artists like Queen Latifah, Moni Love, Salt and Pepper, and TLC offered alternatives. Now, by the mid-1990s, the Riot Girl bands became so well known that more commercialized pop culture started to incorporate and co-opt the movement's messages. So the phrase girl power was often used by Bikini Kill, uh, can be found throughout Riot Girl zines. Um, but the phrase you know, quickly became a pop culture slogan after more commercial groups like the Spice Girls, pictured here, uh, began using it. So there was a real media misrepresentation connecting Riot Girl groups to these more commercial bands, and it led um, several of the Riot Girl groups to dissolve. 
though more individually, many of those former participants did continue to make political music. Now, the commercialization of feminism during the 1990s is something that third waivers really struggled with. To what degree was mainstream culture adopting a more feminist viewpoint? And to what degree was it about corporations using feminism simply to sell products rather than taking action? And of course, this is a struggle that continues today. So although the prominence of riot girl groups was short-lived, their specific brand of feminism resonated with many women that may not have identified with the concerns of mainstream feminism. And riot girl groups inspired radical global activism for years to come with riot girl bands and chapters forming in Asia, Europe, Australia, and Latin America. And so pictured here, we have one of the most famous contemporary examples the Russian feminist punk band and performance art group Pussy Riot. So once more, we see the legacy of the third wave living on today. Oh, sorry, it's trying to get it well in frame. So the end of the third wave. Here we see the Is Feminism Dead? Time Magazine cover from June, 1998 featuring Susan B. Anthony, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, and fictional TV character, Ally McBeal. Now, I think this cover serves as a good example of the challenges inherent to defining and describing the waves and doing the actual work of feminism. You have mainstream media outlets like this presenting a skewed and reductive image of the movement, an all white set of activists capped off with a white fictional character who's not emblematic of the organization going on at the time or the individuals actually doing the work. So the article voiced a common critique of the third wave that it was more concerned with superficiality than substance. Now, some of that is attributable to the media coverage of the time. So, you know, this is that kind of soundbite thing. For example, the Spice Girls got more attention than voter registration drives or transnational networking among activists. Um, but some of that had to do with shifting perspectives and priorities. So for example, there were young women who argued that their self-expression through clothes and makeup, that that was empowering rather than materialistic or superficial. Now, personally, I think the historian Lisa Levenstein, who wrote the book, they Didn't See Us Coming, The Hidden History of Feminism in the 90s, captures the situation better when she writes, quote, throughout the 1990s, activists fiercely debated who feminism should represent and what strategies it should employ. Such disagreements proliferated not because feminism was losing its way, but because so many different people increasingly felt invested in shaping the movement, end quote. Still, this lack of uniform agenda and lack of a single definition meant that the third wave was hard to define, it was hard to describe. And so that has contributed to the confusion that often surrounds it. So some scholars believe that the third wave never came to an end and that it continues on to this day. But for others, they think that new technology and social media campaigns have marked the beginning of a fourth wave of feminism. Uh, one that we're living through right now. So stay tuned for that fourth wave exhibit um, and, and the symposium to learn more about the feminist movement in the 21st century. So that concludes the tour of the exhibit. And with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you so much, Mariana, for that, um, that wonderful tour. I apologize, some people were saying that they were having a some volume issues um, and unfortunately I wasn't able to get the closed captioning up mid uh, mid session it didn't want to it didn't want to cooperate in that way so I, I do apologize if you were having some some volume issues um, and I also wanted to uh, send a thank you to Carrie Lee Alexander she was the original curator of, of this exhibit and did um, this extraordinary um, fellowship that you see before you um, Mari, since we're right here at the end of the exhibit, I, I wanted to start with a question, um, considering the, the times that we're in now. 
Um, there was a question, and this actually came from the, the symposium that we just finished back in September on the third wave, where um, a question was raised by an audience member, do you foresee a fifth wave of feminism um, happening? Is it, are we in the midst of a, a fifth wave bubbling up even, even now? Wave. Um, you know, I, I think having looked at the, the material written on the idea of the fourth wave, I think, um, I, I, I think uh, the present moment can well be uh, summed up into, into that. Just it's, the internet is such a revolution. Social media is such a revolution that while that has changed, you know, this idea of the fourth wave, in some ways it goes as late as um, the, sorry, as early as the late 90s. You could say it starts in 2005, six, seven with the advent of social media then. And of course, today what we're looking at how social media is used it's very different than in its earliest days, but I think it marks such a fundamental shift that my instinct is to um, put that all as, as one category. But that gets into the question of, you know, what is the problem with the waves metaphor to begin with? Um, and so I think we're absolutely in a moment of unprecedented action. I mean, we saw the Women's March in 2017 and years since, uh, you know, biggest, worldwide protest in history. Um, so absolutely, we are in a, a key moment right now. Um, the historicizing of it, you know, that's something that, that writers and scholars will love to fight about um, for a long time. And uh, so there's, there's different answers to it, but I would, I would say fourth wave. Yeah. Um, to piggyback off of that, and I'm looking at just for your, your personal opinion uh, here again, but um, what is your own perception of using the, the term or the metaphor waves to describe these different um, moments of activism in, in women's history? I think it's useful at the very high level to um, talk about what are the kind of most visible aspects of a movement at a certain time, what are um, the, the key issues. I, um, you know, there was an emphasis on suffrage in the first wave. There was an emphasis on, um, you know, uh, overturning legal uh, barriers to equal opportunity for women during the second wave. Uh, it's, it's simply that you can't, rely on it too heavily because those are all true, but there's exceptions to all those cases. We're still working on voting rights today. You know, suffrage is still an issue for many communities and not just for women, for, you know, people of color, for indigenous people. There's, there's a long list with these voting rights laws. Um, and so all these issues stay, stay present. So you just, it, it can be useful as a, here's the very macro level, but when you wanna go even a little beyond that, you have to talk about labor organizing in the forties and fifties. You have to talk about uh, the work of, of um, black women during the civil rights movement against sexual violence. There's all these components to it that don't get the attention in, um, you know, and then there, there's also the element I tried to weave in through here of who is the media paying attention to? You know, it's it's not surprising that they put four white women on this cover. Um, and so we also have to escape the idea that what mainstream media was reporting on for each wave is what each wave actually was. There were a lot more voices, a lot more people, a lot more issues, disagreements, everything. Um, so after the high level, we got to really interrogate. Thank you for that. Um, one of our, our audience members is asking about one of those uh, voices that is often marginalized in any retelling of, of history, women's or US or any other. And that is um, the lack of discussion surrounding indigenous women and their work during the third wave, um, particularly given the proximity to indigenous people's day tomorrow. Oh, that's right, yes. Um, all I can say to that is there, there's so much that is not in this exhibit that I, I would love to feature. Um, you know, the third wave, I, 
it was really led by women of color from lots of different backgrounds. I don't have a personal expertise on the work of indigenous women during the third wave, um, but you, you can't tell that story um, without them. You can't tell the story today. Uh, and so the connections between particularly third and fourth wave um, with the work of indigenous women is, is absolutely crucial. Um, but there's also a lot of you know, room in this exhibit to talk more about the contributions of queer women um, and the activism that was going on there and different linkages that were made across communities. Um, and so across communities, and I, I make one mention to it, but I would say across national borders, this was also a time of a lot of um, uh, bringing in of the, of the developing world, the of different transnational connections of, you had the 1995 fourth, um, fourth wave, fourth conference, the UN conference in Beijing on women um, that was this giant international effort. Um, so I just say that to say, you know, I'm, I apologize that there isn't more of that in here, but there's, there's a lot um, that could also be included that I think is just more evidence of the women from all different walks of life who were contributing and shaping the movement at this time. Definitely, thank you. And um, that is up for for the, the next discussion that will be happening. We, we will be um, publish, publishing the uh, Feminism, the Fourth Wave exhibit in early December. We'll be having a, a panel discussion around that, the missing waves of feminism, the fourth wave, December 12th. Um, and so the question from the audience here is, according to those who see us being in a fourth wave, what was or were the transitions from the third to the fourth wave? Um, yes, I think third to the fourth wave, the, the biggest one uh, I alluded to earlier is the move to the internet. Um, now the internet was not created in the 21st century. Uh, it's obviously, you know, you get the zine culture of the 1990s. There was a lot of connecting online back into the 80s, much more in the 90s. It's the 2000s where you get social media and you're able to um, just connect with people farther away in different environments uh, instantaneously. Um, so I think that's by far the, the biggest marker. Um, the other transition points, I would, I think a lot of it has to do with um, you know, it's several years in there. It's the Me Too campaign and Time's Up and the and entertainment and other um, workplaces. Uh, you had the um, Christine Blasey Ford hearings uh, when Brett Kavanaugh was nominated to the Supreme Court and the reaction to that, simply the election of Donald Trump and uh, the reaction to that, the women's marches, all this sort of um, organizing that came as a result. Uh, so it's, you know, it's this continuation and it's these moments like the Anita Hill hearing where people see um, what, what rights that maybe we think we have that we need to protect or advocate for more. And, um, and then also, you know, you have young people once again leading the way. Uh, Gen Z, you have this much broader understanding of sex and gender, of um, bringing in trans rights, uh, you know, the kind of uh, breaking down the gender binary. Um, so that's a big element of, of what's happening right now that, um, it, you know, it was there. You look at Judith Butler and the third wave gender trouble, destabilizing those categories, but you see it move out of the academy into um, more general conversation. So uh, transitions like that that are helped by, you know, the internet and social media. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot more, but those are the things that came to mind off the top of my head. Thank you for that. And then I uh, don't have a lot of questions coming in anymore. So I, I'm going to ask this because we pose it to all of our presenters. And I'd love to give you this platform to, to answer it yourself. Um, what call to action or mm, takeaway would you like this audience to leave with? Um, I would say I probably have two. 
Um, one is as a historian, which is to not accept a kind of surface level explanation of what these waves are, what the movement was. Um, and so to, to really examine it, because I think sometimes uh, even, or especially folks who wanna get involved and take action can kind of be distracted by um, maligning work that was done previously when there's a lot to that story. There's been a lot of good work that's been going on there. Um, you know, the, the media has, I think, distorted how uh, the movement has been represented. So to really just uh, explore this history, because you can gain such inspiration from the work that people were doing 150 years ago or 40 years ago, or, you know, it's 10 years ago that you didn't know about. Um, and then otherwise, uh, just, yeah, uh, how to get boots on the ground to do something right now. I mean, there's, there's lots of issues going on. Uh, it, it's what um, calls out to you um, most prominently. Obviously, there's been a lot of attention to reproductive rights with the situation in Texas right now. Um, but to think about the, the long history of these fights and what we can do today, whether it's you know writing to a legislator or donating money or donating time, um, you know, exploring that history and then using that to take action today. Absolutely, great answer. <laughs> well, thank you again to all of you joining us here today. Just a reminder that this program today is being recorded and will be available on the museum's website later this week. If you enjoyed today's program, please plan to join us on Sunday, October 24th at 3 p.m. when WHM Scholars Advisory Council member, Dr. Sherry Randolph will be in conversation with author Keisha Blaine about her new book, Until I Am Free. A blend of social commentary, biography, and intellectual history, Until I Am Free is a manifesto for anyone committed to social justice. The book challenges, challenges us to listen to a working poor and disabled black woman activist and intellectual of the civil rights movement as we grapple with contemporary concerns around race, inequality and social justice. For a full list of upcoming programs and for registration information, please visit the Sundays at Home page under the public programs tab at womenshistory.org. All of it's for free, but advanced registration is required. Thank you again, Mariana, for sharing your time and talents with us. We greatly appreciate it. And until next time we meet, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all. <laughs>